Thank, thank you very much, Maria. Good morning. Um, apologies, Julia couldn't be here today. I know she would have really loved to be here, but um, I'll try and um, step into her shoes. This is a talk in two parts. Um, and I'm going to start by speaking for her and setting the scene and telling the story of our practice leading up to our latest project in Brighton and give you a little bit of an insight into how the business plan for the British Airways I-360 um, works. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit more detail about the business side of things coming for going forward. So just a little bit of background. Um, Julie and I both studied at the AA in the 1970s. It was obviously a very different time then uh, from today. We um, met solving our own housing needs by taking direct action in occupying and subsequently uh, repairing some derelict properties in South London. These were all earmarked for demolition. Um, it was a very different place then than today and still bore scars from the Second World War many empty houses, lots of them owned by local authorities or the GLC as it was then. And um, many of these authorities embarked on large, big social housing renewal projects, um, but they'd stalled. Um, and so short life housing associations, otherwise known as squatting associations, emerged in response to the then housing needs, um, not nearly as dramatic as today's housing needs. In the diploma school of our final year, a group of us uh, joined together and we formed our own unit. Um, the AA at that time nurtured a belief that we could make a difference and take control of our own futures. We became involved in our own um, local park action group. Uh, it was opposite to where we lived. It was surrounded by corrugated iron. It was part of the, um, an area that had been designated as part of the Abercrombie plan in 1944, but by the end of the 70s, um, it was still surrounded, you know, it was still a derelict, a derelict area. And so we drew up an alternative uh, plan um, and applied to central government to get some money for the park. And um, surprise, surprise, we got half a million pounds. Um, of course, the local authority took it over and they managed the project. But it was our first sort of taste of um, direct action, if you like in trying to get investment for projects that need to happen. So after leaving the AA, we formed a model-making company. Uh, there wasn't a lot of interesting work around, except in a very few architectural and engineering practices, and so we made models for the likes of Rogers and Arabs, and um, you know, that was, that was a, just a stroke of luck. Uh, we made quite a few um, working models for Lloyd's, and then we moved on to become part of the architectural team as architectural assistants working for um, Richard Rogers and Partners. It was an absolutely brilliant experience. Julia subsequently moved to work for Norman Foster. I became team leader on, on, on one of the packages for uh, Lloyd's and Julia eventually became project architect for the um, Royal Academy Sackler Galleries. We spent seven or eight years with Rogers and Fosters, and it was just the most um, terrific apprenticeship. We learned so much, um, not only about an approach to architecture, but also about how to run a practice. So we set up our own practice in 1989, um, and um, we won a competition. We won a competition for a bridge of the future with uh, Jane Wernick, um, who's become a, a lifelong friend and collaborator. Um, it was our first competition success. Uh, we then moved on to work on a, a speculative project for a, the conversion of a dockyard in the south of France in the Bay of Toulon with designs for an aquasphere in which we were also part of the development company. So this was a very interesting insight to um, architectural practice where we're not just providing a service for somebody else, but we're actually part of the project. We're actually minor shareholders in the project. and, and and that was a real eye-opener. Eye we then won a competition for a, a UK developer, um, big job, 35 million pound um, job, Thames Valley Park. He asked us to move out of the shed where we were working next to our house into proper offices to realize the project. Our overheads went up 10 times and, and then the 1990s recession hit. 
So that project and all the other projects we had disappeared. Um, I mean, everybody knows the construction industry tends to be the canary in the coal mine, but we found ourselves with no work, in negative equity, and with three kids. So when we saw a competition in the Sunday Times in 1993 asking for ideas for a landmark to celebrate the millennium, we, we actually needed something to cheer, cheer us up. Um, we had a bit of spare time, an empty office, and we needed to come up with something audacious um, to take a leap out of what was a, a pretty big hole. We didn't win the competition. Nobody won. The judges didn't think any of the ideas were good enough. Um, but we decided to pursue it ourselves. We thought there was something in it, and we became, as Julia describes it, creative entrepreneurs. We set up a company that we called the Millennium Wheel Company, ultimately became the London Eye Company. We did some research about land ownership, very complicated, but not insurmountable. Put in a planning application, and the rest, as you say, is history. Um, We've now been in practice for 26 years. Um, we have a very diverse um, portfolio of projects, um, some of which where we just provide a normal architectural service. A few we generate ourselves. We obviously enter a lot of competitions, um, and occasionally we have um, some repeat clients. Um, but we don't necessarily wait for someone to come to us with a problem that needs solving. We can see problems around us all the time, or opportunities around us all the time, and we, we engage with that. So after the London Eye, we engaged with what we felt was the housing problem, the lack of housing for key workers. And it, this may look a little ubiquitous today, but then there were no towers being built uh, for housing. And our idea was that it should provide a triple bottom line, not just a profit motive, but also a, or an economic or financial motive, but also an environmental and a social uh, benefit. And so these were um, community-based, um, high-rise dwellings, mixed use, um, using renewable energy, very green, soft, communal spaces, um, quite idealistic, um, but we never got it off the ground, and, and, and the model has been taken over by a very different form of housing um, today. Um, but we had a business plan for that, and um, we got pretty close to building one in Lambeth. Um, the problem, I suppose, is that you know, when you come up with ideas and you work with the public sector, you don't always get to deliver them because all of a sudden you find yourself in competition for a tender um, competing with a lot of other developers. And, um, and that, that's a tough one, I think, because if we're to use as creative entrepreneurs, as architects, our skills to try and solve problems, I think we need to find a better way of working with the public sector where you know, if you come up with good ideas, you have a fair crack at actually delivering them, as opposed to finding that you're just giving ideas to other people to, um, to, to, to exploit. And, you know, I mean, obviously the, the Garden Bridge is obviously a case in point. Um, recently, um, nothing wrong with, with people pursuing their own ideas, um, but there needs to be a balance as to the risk and the reward involved. Otherwise, we just stand back and wait for people to come to us and say, can you solve this problem or that problem? Um, one of the other ideas we had was um, you know, energy in the city. This was a, this was a project for wind turbines. Um, how could we produce, let's say, something like 10% of the energy needs of the city, in the city itself, using um, wind power? And um, this is using vertical, um, silent vertical axis uh, wind turbines along the rivers, along the major trunk roads, uh, along the M25. Um, and we did, we did a business plan to show how you could provide you know, on roundabouts um, a substantial amount of green energy in the city. And of course, 
you know, that's where you want to use the energy, so why not produce it in the city? If you can produce it in a green way, that was what was done historically. The only reason we don't have um, uh, atomic energy plants in the city is it's too dangerous. But if you can provide green energy in the city, that's where you need it, shortest distance to where it's needed. Um, so that, that was a plan. Also didn't come off. A lot of our ideas don't come off. Um, you know, they start with an idea, they develop into a business plan, um, but there's lots of hurdles um, before you can make things actually happen. And sometimes maybe they're not really a very good idea at all, so you don't really know until you try. Um, we've done lots of different ways of um, sort of looking at different businesses. So for example, we've designed a furniture system um, where instead of just taking a fee, we get a royalty. We've been taking a royalty now for 15 years on a furniture system. That's a very interesting way of providing a service and being having a continual uh, reward, far in excess of what you would normally get as a, as a normal design fee. And we're currently working on a, um, a, um, our local park again, which is now beautiful and green, um, but has a major maintenance problem. There's no money to maintain the park. And so we're looking at some of the development opportunities around the park to see whether it's possible to leverage that um, to provide a long-term um, revenue for maintaining the park. So Lambeth owns the sites. Um, we create a trust to build housing, either for students or for third age. Um, and um, the, 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 the excess rent from that would go to maintain the park. Very simple idea, strategy. Um, and um, so that this is in progress. But again, you know, are we going to be able to deliver this? Is it going to go to competition? Are we going to lose it? Um, is somebody else going to do it? Are they going to sell the sites as opposed to maintain them um, and retain them? We don't know. Um, when we look at business plans, um, you know, there are, th th there's lots of different ways of looking at it. This is a fairly classic way. You've got nine building blocks, if you like. You've got your, your customers or your market segments. Your, your, your value proposition, or what is the problem that you're trying to solve, the channels, the sales, you know, where it's going to go, customer relationships, which you need to establish and maintain, the revenue streams, the key resources, the key activities that you carry out, key partnerships, whether you're outsourcing or doing it all in-house, and, uh, and the cost structure. And, the, and, and I think out of that, we want to see three main um, benefits, as I said before, social, environmental, and economic or, or financial. And we write business plans. We write business plans for our practice every year, the one on the left, um, where we review how we've done. Um, and we never do quite as well as we hoped. But, um, uh, you know, it, it gives us a pointer um, to go forward. And we've also written business plans, obviously, for the London Eye, for Sky House, for Brighton I360. And I'll talk about Brighton I360, the British Airways I360, in, in a moment. Um, and they're, they're very similar, these business plans. They just need a few more bits and pieces added on to what you would normally do as an architect. Um, so I probably can't read that, but list of contents um, on the left of our own architectural business plan list of contents on the right of the business plan for the British Airways I-360. Um, and they're, they're very, very similar. Um, you know, as architects, we coordinate and orchestrate a whole range of different um, disciplines to bring projects to fruition. Um, we have to coordinate and manage the production of lots of different reports from design reports, environmental reports, traffic reports, liability reports. And as architects, we're trained to do all that. So, you know, add a few more, um, you know, business planning or market assessment or financial advice, a few more advisors in the mix, and you've got um, a business, a parallel business, um, not just providing architectural services, but actually 
development services. Um, and you're, you're embedded in the project, it's your project, um, either as a minor shareholder or as we've been able to do on British Airways I360, a major shareholder. So there's nothing to be scared of in terms of you know, expanding um, you know, the, the range of services that we provide as architects into development. Um, there is one big difference. Um, you need lots of lawyers. Um, so normally, you know, you might enter into um, a deed of appointment, a collateral warranty, maybe a couple of other uh, legal agreements. If you're doing development, you're going to be entering into a hundred plus uh, different agreements, and you're going to be becoming good friends with lots of lawyers. Um, but that's that's good too. So this is um, this is signing the uh, British Airways I three. 60 contracts um, back in June 2014. That's Eleanor Harris on my right, our chief executive, who's basically set up the business um, and it's now up and running and it opened in August. Um, and this is it. It's a um, 162 meter high, very slender <coughs> steel tower up which rises a, an 18 meter diameter pod, probably about the size of this room actually. A draw a circle in this room, that's about the size of the pod, carries 200 people up to about 138 meters height. Same kind of experience as the London Eye. We realize that this is something that people really enjoy. People love to be taken up high, to be you know, gently removed from the humdrum of everyday life, to get a great view. The subliminal message I suppose, is that we live on a very beautiful earth and we need to look after it a little better. Um, but it's also just a, a great experience. It's built on the root end of the um, uh, West Pier, um, which uh, famously was a, a grade one listed pier designed by Eugenius Birch in 1866, um, modified throughout the years, very, very popular in the early um, 20th century. Uh, but then sadly disappeared in 2003 through ravaged by fire and, and storm. So our idea here was to turn the pier through 90 degrees and whereas in Victorian times um, the pier would have invited people to, to promenade out and to walk out over water and get a view back of the city, taking the sea air, etc. We're inviting people to go up and down and promenade um, walk on air, as it were, a different kind of view. Um, it was built very innovatively. Um, here are the, the steel cans that made up the tower uh, arriving from, um, from Rotterdam uh, straight onto the beach um, where it was erected using a jacking frame. So in other words, it was built from the, the top down, um, lifting the tower up and inserting pieces of a steel can underneath as it jacked up. So the jacking tower here is 11 meters square, 60 meters high, and the final lift, it would have cantilevered out 100 meters out the top of the t jacking tower um, and, and weighed about just under 1,000 tons. Um, it's all bolted together. Uh, this is a skidding, skidding track that allowed the, uh, the, um, the cans to be inserted under the tower as it was lifted up. Um, and they're all bolted together, and it's a, it's a very robust and stable structure. It's extremely slender. It holds the Guinness Book of, or the Guinness World Record for the most slender structure, um, tall structure, um, but it's got damping systems to stop it moving. Um, and, and there it is. Um, As I said, it opened in uh, August. We've had just over 200,000 visitors on it in the first uh, three months of operation. We've restored two of the toll booths from the original 1866 pier um, on the ground, and it's proving to be quite popular. Um, a week ago, it was opened by His uh, Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip, who's a fantastic champion of engineering and design and art and technology has been for over 50 years. 
and, um, and, and also of the environment. He was the first, he was one of the founding members of the World Wildlife Fund, for example. Um, and uh, the combination of, of engineering and environmental um, passion in him, I think it was, a, it, was it was just a great event for everybody involved in this project, which actually took 12 years in the making uh, for him to, um, to come and, um, and, and give it the um, royal seal of approval, if you like. So, um, and the experience can be enhanced with a, with a glass of champagne if you haven't already been, I encourage you to go, um, or the sight of a beautiful sunset. Um, and um, yeah, so this is our, 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 our latest project and it's, it's the culmination of, um, hopefully not the last thing we're gonna do, but the culmination of um, our experience which started back in Stockwell in the 1970s. So the market for our British Airways i360 project. Um, Brighton um, you know, it might not be the most obvious place to do something like this, um, but actually, you know, when you look at the market, there's over seven, and this, this was done in 2008, 7.1 million tourists stay within an hour of Brighton. 1.4 million residents within an hour. Um, 15.2 million within two hours. One third almost of the it's actually not the UK population, but the population of England is within a two-hour drive of Brighton. When we started the project, Brighton was getting eight million visitors a year. Um, last year, got 11. This year, 10, possibly to do with Southern Rail. But um, it's an incredibly popular destination, very open city. Um, and so we consider the factors um, affecting visitor numbers, you know, how big is the market, what kind of market is it, you know, um, have we got a good site? Um, what's the seasonality like? Um, it's obviously more seasonal than, than London, um, but there's lots of lessons from the London Eye here and from other attractions in Brighton, the Royal Pavilion, Sea Life Centre, the Pier. And you, you build up a picture of where this sits in terms of potential penetration rates and likely visitor numbers because you have to start with a business plan that's going to be financially viable. Um, pricing. and projected visitor numbers. So you segment the market, you do an analysis, and you work out your numbers. Somewhere between 700 and 800,000 visitors a year is what we're expecting. So having done 200,000 in the first three months already, we're pretty much on track. What are the benefits of doing something like this? Well, tourism is absolutely key in Brighton. It's an 800 to a billion uh, pound business employing 19,000 people. Um, and this will have a very positive impact on the city in terms of renewing its tourism offer, um, bringing more people to the city, encouraging people to stay longer, to stay overnight, um, increasing footfall, distributing the footfall on the beach further west, helping it to retain its competitiveness, and there's wider spin-off benefits into the local com uh, community. So we're providing jobs, uh, we're employing a lot of local businesses, um, and embedding ourselves into the local business community. 75 um, full-time jobs, um, plus management roles, plus spin-off jobs, plus people who are providing services to us. Um, we've got catering concessionaire, as apprenticeships, um, and plus there were the jobs during the construction. So although a lot of the construction was carried out by European partners that we worked with on the London Eye, we also employed a local firm, JT Mackley, uh, to do all the, um, the engineering, civil engineering, and the main building works. 
wider community benefits. What we did on the London Eye, rather than just give a cash upfront Section 106 payment to the local authority, we said, we'll give you 1% of all ticket sales in perpetuity. And that money in the London Eye um, over the 15 years has paid for a huge amount of work on the South Bank, the regeneration, re-landscaping of Jubilee Gardens. It's currently generating, you know, probably in the region of about half a million pounds a year. Um, and that's in perpetuity. So we've done a similar thing in Brighton. Obviously, it's a smaller scale in Brighton. Um, we offer discounts to local residents, free entry to school kids, free tickets to local charities, um, and all of this money goes to help to regenerate the seafront, which is in um, dire need of repair. Development cost of the project, roughly 46 million pounds, broken down into the normal you know, construction fees. Um, but then a few other things that you don't normally see in a cost plan, which is the arrangement fee, the commitment fee, uh, which are all financing fees that go straight to the council. So the council already made a million pounds uh, during the construction of the project. I'm going to explain how the project was financed in a moment. Um, originally, um, this is going to take a little too long, so I'm not going to go back on the history of how the project was originally going to be financed, but basically the world fell in in 2008. Everybody knows Lehman Brothers collapsed and bank lending dried up. So our original sources of funding all dried up. We then spent the next four or five years trying to find alternative sources of finance. And what, what we eventually found was um, annuity funding from pension funds. And this was um, quite interesting because you could get very long dated, um, low interest rate um, funds. All you needed was an asset, a property, and uh, slightly more difficult, uh, a, a guarantee. So we approached the council and said, well, what, a, what about um, a guarantee? And um, they looked at this and they thought it was very interesting. They could see that they could make a margin on this by lending to us at a commercial rate. But then they came back and said, actually, um, we've, we've, got a, we've, got, we've, we've got a better idea. Um, what we'll do is we'll, we'll provide you a senior loan from Public Works Loan Board. So in other words, they arrange the money from um, uh, a source which is part of the UK Debt Management Office called the Public Works Loan Board, or PWLB. Um, we would put in some money, we'd get some money from the local enterprise partnership, but essentially the council would act as the senior lender in the scheme. Um, so they would borrow the money from the PWLB, uh, which would be drawn down during construction and applied to meet the payments. Um, that would include rolled up interest. And uh, they would only put in their money after we put in our money and after the LEP had put in their money as well. It would be a 27-year <clears throat> term loan. Um, and the capital repayments would be amortized over 25 years. Um, so they would have security, full security over the, over the project. Um, they would have step-in rights. They would have everything needed uh, to... Um, to uh, to step in should there be any, any, any problems. Uh, and, and also a cash sweep to accelerate the payments if they wanted to do so. Um, over the term of the loan, they make 25 million pounds. I mean, that's, that's a fantastic deal for a local authority. So rather than borrowing money in the city and the profits going back to the city in London, here's a deal where local authorities can not only get a project, get the regeneration, get the Section 106 um, payments, but also make money on a development um, for themselves, money that they could then use for schools and roads and regeneration, money that you wouldn't be able to get from government for anything else. PWLB money is only available for commercially uh, viable schemes, schemes that can repay. So here's a base case. You can see the uh, council payment at the bottom, the margin, which is their profit, the LEP in yellow, and our, and our, and our business case over the 27-year project. Um, this, is when, this is what it looks like um, when you accelerate that repayment. Um, 
still a lot in it for everybody. And, and that's, that's where we are. Um, so just, just to, to summarize what the benefits are for the council, um, over a million pounds a year, over 25 years, over a million pounds arrangement and commitment fees during the construction, cash sweep, excess profits, providing them with an income stream to fund seafront repairs of which they've estimated about 70 million pounds. Um, and it supports a core strategy of theirs and a vision that the tourism industry needs to grow significantly but sustainably into a year-round profitable business. So I hope that this just shows you that you can use your skills as an architect not just to advance the business model of providing architectural services, but to um, find opportunities, um, uh, solve other problems, um, using all those skills that you already have as architects, just by widening the net a little bit and, um, and taking a broader view. Thank you very much. Thank you. Don't go away. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for David? There should be some roaming mics kicking around somewhere. Do we have the mics? Oh, well, while the mics are on their way, maybe you could uh, shout. Um, yeah, go ahead. If you stand up and maybe say who you are. Right, so the, the, the question is, um, uh, well, as I understand it, were, were, the, were the architectural fees economic? <laughs> Is that the question? More, we put a lot of effort as architects into projects over yeah. two, three, four, or five year periods versus I think the perception that maybe the, the finance guys earn a lot more for a lot less. Yeah, of course they do. And it was on the radio this morning. I mean, the financial sector earns more per head than any other uh, industry in the, in the country. But also, the point that was being made is it has the most unequal. Uh, pay between men and women. So it's not, it's not a good model to follow. But you know, we know the story about financialization. The reality of architectural fees is that they are what they are. You know, you're in a marketplace and you can't really command uh, more than someone is, is willing to pay, even if you are your own client, as we were. Um, so our fees reflect the reality. Um, you know, we don't necessarily always make a profit on our architectural fees. But our other activities, our other businesses, um, sort of make up for that. Um. Any more questions? Do you want to pick or should I pick? <laughs> All right, let's go over here. <laughs> I'm sort of interested in the beginning, when you've got your idea, how do you finance this period until you can really convince investors? It's changed over the years. Um, I mean, in the case of the, the London Eye, we, we, put our, we put our house on the line, we put our business on the line, we put our reputations on the line. Um, I'm assuming you have to pay lawyers, you have to pay sort of your advisors, you, 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 you just charm you, them you, into... You beg, borrow and plead, <laughs> and, um, and, you, and you, you, you use the resources that you're able, feel capable of um, allocating to the project. You, you have to take risk. Um, of course you have to take risk. But then, you know, the London Eye was hugely successful and we exited. In fact, that was one thing I wanted to talk about a little bit because quite a lot of um, businesses and entrepreneurial businesses, you're expected to exit. Um, you know, if you're borrowing money from a venture capital fund or an equity fund, they want to get out after you know, anywhere between three and seven years. And, 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 and they, want you to, they want to drag you out as well. Um, and that's what happened with us on the London Eye. But, you know, we hadn't intended it to go that way, um, but every cloud has a silver lining and, and, and we got some money out of it, which we were then able to plow into our project in, uh, in, in Brighton. And um, 
and, and, that, and that's our, our model. I mean, we're, you know, we take the profits from a project and, and put it back into another project, which hopefully has more benefits for society and the environment and, and you know, is, is a sustainable model. Okay, there's some more over here. Anyone over here? Or has that been answered? Or there's, did you have a question, sir? There's Mike behind you. Um, I just wanted to find out, uh, Paul of Architect Studios, how do you gain cooperation to use uh, this site? I mean, obviously you've got uh, these ideas and then uh, you're looking for a site, isn't it? So how do you gain cooperation? Do you plead, what's, uh, what's the strategy? Well, you, you have to persuade people that you have a good business plan, you know, that there's a case for it. Um, so in the case of, 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 of Brighton, there was a, a derelict site, um, it was looking for a project, um, we were a project looking for a site. Um, they needed to be convinced that it was a viable project, and it it takes time. Um, you know, so in in the case of Brighton, I was introduced to the West Pier Trust, the owners of the site, in um, 2005, and um, I think we had a, a development agreement with them something like six months later or a year later, planning permission 18 months later. Um, but it's, you know, you have, you, have to, you have to find the common ground um, between the ideas, the site, the finance, the business plan, um, and, and bring it all together. You just have to think in the round. Um, and, you know, as I was saying, I mean, it's, you, you have to take risk as well. I mean, it's not, it's not for the faint-hearted. It's not for everybody. Um, you know, these kind of projects, the ones that we've been involved with, the, the London Eye, and Brighton Eye 360 are incredibly difficult to finance because you know, there, isn't, there isn't a real property there. It's basically, it's a business. It's people coming. Are people gonna come or are they not gonna come? It's not like doing a, an asset-based uh, development on, on, a, on a property, commercial property or residential property, which is a different, different kettle of fish altogether in which there are many, many players and many, a lot of competition. Um, but this is, a, this is a kind of a niche we've found. Um, but we're doing other things as well. So, you know, we're looking at a much smaller project, for example. We're, we're trying to prototype a drinking water fountain. We're fed up with plastic bottles everywhere. And we want to bring back drinking water fountains, publicly accessible drinking water fountains, in public domain, where that don't block up, that don't break down, um, that provide you know, free water for people. Um, whether we'll make that work, I don't know. It's an idea at the moment. Uh, a couple of people are interested in having some, um, but we're still at the, pro at, the, at, the, at the point of prototyping it and, um, and seeing if we can turn it into a viable business. Thank you. There was a... I'm just wondering, um, your method of sourcing funding was wholly, um, wholly exclusive to proje projection of visitor numbers. Is that something you could get completely wrong? And if so, could it damage the council? And if so, is that on your conscience? <laughs> that <laughs> could really sink Brighton. Everything, every, every, everything I do is on my conscience. Yeah. So, the, but the, the you know, we don't do any of this lightly, and we don't do any of this just on our own. We work with experts in the field, and obviously, you know, whoever we're dealing with on the other side, their counterparties are also using experts in the field. Um, and, um, and, and, and so we, you know, hopefully we don't get it wrong. But the, the, the reality of the business case in, in, in Brighton, for example, is that the visitor numbers would have to fall so far below the projections before it had an impact on our ability to service the debt that the risk is so small um, that it's insignificant. There's a question over here. Um, so you talked a lot about business plans, your um, office has a business plan, um, and I think all our practices also have business plans and try and um, uh, make it such that they can um, uh, turn a profit and uh, use that profit in varying different ways. Um, I'm interested in um, the figure that you have in your mind or as a business whereby you say, 
from the profit that you make as an organization, you're prepared to plow that into all these ideas that you have because obviously many, many hours, days, years are invested in this and there's no return from it. At the end of the year, how much do you save from your profits? Well, I'm, I'm going to spend X percentage on projects that I don't know if they're going to go anywhere. Just as a business model, how do you resolve that for yourselves? Um, w w in internally within the practice, um, we do it in collaboration with our other directors. So we consult with them, you know, how much time do they want to spend on, I mean, it's a bit like deciding how much time you want to spend on competitions. Um, so there isn't, a, there isn't a fixed figure. It's usually determined by what we think our turnover is going to be and what we can afford. Um, but <clears throat> I, th I suppose we have the additional benefit in that Julie and I have also personally profited from our investment in the London Eye because that wasn't the practice investing our house, our office, our reputations. That was us personally. Um, so as far as that's concerned, that side of it, we're all in. Um, you know, we, we, we're not buying chateaus in France or yachts or, you know, we're doing projects. Um, we're plowing our money back into things like Brighton, drinking water fountains, etc. No, it, it changes from year to year. It's, it, and, and it's done in consultation. You know, it depends on what we, where we think, you know, it, it depends very much on where we think we're going. Um, you know, how much time we can afford on competitions, how much time we can afford on speculative ventures. So, um, you know, some of the speculative ventures are, are, are just ideas that we, um, we come up with um, you know, there isn't a competition, but there's an idea, so we invest in design, we spend time um, as though you were doing a competition. Um, so it just falls into the same, into the same mix. Um, but most of the, the allocation is to real competitions, but some of it is for purely speculative, blue sky thinking, um, here's a problem that we'd like to try and solve. Okay, one final question over here. Oh, Charles, I thought you had a question. No question from Charles. One more question, or I've got one. Sorry, somebody pointing. I can't. Ah, there we go. <laughs> Raise your hands nice and high, please. Thank um, you. <laughs> thank you. My name is David Coles, David Coles Architects. Can you just explain, please, the role of British Airways in your projects? Um, okay, well, in, on, on the London Eye, British Airways had a very significant role. They were one-third shareholder and guarantor of the uh, construction cost. Um, and so when it went over budget, British Airways picked up the tab at a very healthy um, interest rate of 25%, I have to say. Um, so they made a lot of money on that um, when they sold in, in 2006. I think they made more money out of the London Eye than they do out of a transatlantic um, carrier. But um, on this project, on the Brighton project, they're simply naming rights sponsors. So they pay us a lot of money every year to have their name associated with it. But they have no equity, uh, no direct operational involvement at all. The company um, that I chair is called Brighton I360 Limited, and we own British Airways I360. We, we, we own and operate it. We've got a number of shareholders. We're not, we're the print, Julie and I are principal shareholders, but not the only shareholders. Um, and we have, you know, obviously significant stakeholders in the form of the local council, the West Pier Trust, the owners of the site, the local enterprise partnership, Coast to Capital, um, and the local community, residents and businesses. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much, David. Um, Thank you. That was a very, very inspiring start to the day. We've learned much from you, not least that the experience can be improved with a glass of champagne. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, thank you. <laughs>